Hey, this morning, uh, we're going to be in the book of John, and in doing so, uh, looking at chapter 9, at a, a story of uh, particular interest uh, to me, uh, where Jesus ministers to a man who is born blind. Anytime that Jesus does these miracles, there are a couple things that are being proved by the biblical authors. Number one, Jesus has authority over the natural realm. Number two, Jesus operates in signs, wonders, and miracles which testify to his messianic claim. And number three, Jesus has the authority given to him by the Father. And in doing so, it causes divine turnaround in people's lives and brings them to a place of account by which they must choose this day whom they will serve. In the New Testament, miracles never existed in a vacuum. They always came with a response. Because when you have a revelation of the power, the goodness, the glory, and the authority of God, what it does is it puts a responsibility on your life to align yourself under that which you have seen and that which you have heard. It is a dangerous prayer to pray to ask God to show you his glory. And I know it's a prayer that we often pray. Sometimes we even sing it in a charismatic setting. But I'm telling you, when you see his glory, you become responsible for the things that you have seen. When you see the display of his beauty, his brilliance, and his sovereignty, what it does is it calls the human heart to account. Will you align your life under the hand of the Lord, or in doing so, will you see these signs, harden your heart, and turn away from the one who is calling you by name? When you see the power of God, inherently within what you see is a mandate, a response, and a responsibility that compels us either towards Christological fidelity or back towards wayward living. And in John 9, a miracle occurs, and in doing so, a conversation is started, and you see the dichotomous response of the man who was born blind and the Pharisees who are irritated at the miracle. In verse 1 of John 9, the Bible says this, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. He saw a man who was blind from birth. I want you to watch the contrasting effect of verse 1. Jesus is passing by and he sees a man who cannot see him. Now, aren't you thankful today that Jesus saw you when you didn't have the ability to see him? He reached you when you didn't have the strength to reach him. He loved you when you didn't even have the capacity to love yourself. Can we stop here for just a minute this morning? You are seen by Jesus. You might not know it. You might not recognize it. You might not even feel it. But right where you're at this morning... You are seen by this God. And in a world where it is so easy to feel lost and alone today, you are known and seen by the very creator of the universe. And my friend, that is a reason to rejoice. Not only does he see me, he is familiar with my sufferings. He is a partner in my pain. He is an advocate on my behalf. He is a present help in my time of need. See, from the beginning of time, the temptation of humanity is to hide from God and then be convinced that he cannot see us. But I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's like David says, where can I go to escape his presence? <laughs> the man didn't become blind. He was born blind, which means this, being blind was all he knew. He had no frame of reference for what it was like to have vision. No memory of the way the trees blew in the wind or, or how the flowers would bloom in the spring. And in a similar manner, you and I, we are born into a world that is fractured by sin. See, our world functions with blindness as its preferred mode of operation. 
And watch what Jesus says in John 3. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They didn't like darkness. They didn't prefer darkness. They loved it. Let me give you a warning. People can love the wrong things, and they often do. The goal is not to achieve culture's definition of love. The goal is to achieve scripture's definition of love. Our world says things like this, love is love. That's like drinking out of the toilet and saying water is water. The highest goal of humanity is to not achieve secular love, but instead to love the right things. For we ought to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. The longer you're in the dark, the more you grow accustomed to its appearance. The longer you're in that dysfunction, that addiction, that infirmity, that toxic mindset, the more it becomes an accepted norm for your future. And here is the reality. Humanity cannot save themselves. We are in need of a divine interruption from a superior authority who has the ability to open our eyes to things previously unseen. I was talking to my boy the other day because I walked in and he was watching a TV show, but it was in black and white. And I thought maybe it was just on one of those older channels and it was showing some of the old TV shows. And, and, and I walked in the next day and he was watching that show again in, in black and white and he flipped the channel. And what I recognized is all the channels was in black and white. Now we're poor, but we ain't that poor. <laughs> I said, Matthew, why is you watching it in black and white? He said, I don't know. A setting got changed. Something messed up. Sister did something with the remote control. He said, all these channels are in black and white. I said, well, you want dad to make it color again? He said, no, I got so used to watching it in black and white. It's actually what I prefer. And I thought to myself, my God, this is what it's like for people to operate in spiritual darkness. They have gotten so used to seeing their world through the lens of black and white that they have not experienced the fullness and the goodness of God's glory, which causes color to rise up from the ground all around us. And I'm telling you, today would be a really good day to allow the filter of fractured humanity to be washed away from the vision of your life so you could see things as God intends you to see them. Now watch, the disciples asked him saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, no, neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. See, the disciples are asking the wrong question, for they are looking for someone to blame, and Jesus is looking for someone to heal. See, we live in a fallen world. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. If you try to attach an existential origin to all of life's unexplained pain, you will drive yourself and others insane. Why me? Why now? Why not them? It's unfair. Here's the point, friend. We rarely understand the why and the how of life. And if that's a deal breaker for you, Christianity is not what you want to sign up for. No, following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. One of the most costly things that you can ever give God on this side of eternity is your need to understand. And friend, we have laid that down as an act of costly worship before him. Now, let me caution you. It's very important that you don't develop a weird, narrow theology from John 9. Jesus is not saying, God caused this man to be blind so that later on God could heal him from being blind. So therefore, God could have a cool testimony about the ability to open the eyes of the blind. Instead, he tells his disciples, while you are looking for a person to blame, 
or a problem to solve. I am looking for an opportunity for the power of my Father to be revealed. See, some people's theology is so narrow that everything that happens, no matter how terrible it is, has to be the result of God personally doing it. Hear me, friend. God is not insecure about his sovereignty, and we shouldn't be either. God is not nor has he ever been the author of disease or infirmity. And you can't expect God to heal you of something that you spend time blaming him for. Now we live in a fallen world and the effects of sin are death, hell, destruction, disease, sickness. But Christ has come that we may have life and and life more abundantly. The Bible says every good and perfect thing comes from the Father above. If it's not good and it's not perfect, then you ought to resist the temptation to blame God for you having received it. Though we live in a fallen world. Disease happens, dysfunction happens, trauma happens, divorce happens, collapse happens, bankruptcy happens, unexpected events in life happen. And some people, they've so developed an odd theology about God that it has to be the net result of his doing. And can I tell you, God is in the business, not of causing your pain, but instead of using your pain for a developmental purpose. And it is time to stop blaming God for stuff the devil broke. Now watch verse four, Jesus says this, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. For the night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I love the first three words that Jesus says in verse four. I must work. Friend, if Jesus had to work, so do you. Following Jesus is a lot of hard work. It is not striving. But make no mistake, it is work. Spiritual growth is hard work. Emotional development is hard work. Raising kids is hard work. And if you hate to work, you will hate what the gospel requires of you. You know, I love when people quote Mark Twain. Mark Twain famously said this, find a job you love and you'll never have to work another day in your life. Well, friend, Mark Twain lied. You find something you love, you'll work harder than you ever worked before. Why? Because it's the pearl of great price. It's a treasure hidden in a field. It's a cross that you pick up on your back and you follow hard after Jesus. We are not working to earn his love. We are working from a place of receiving his love. The gospel is not opposed to working. It is opposed to striving. But sometimes in the way that we communicate, we develop this theology of laziness, like this idea, well, God's already done it all and he's already finished it all. So I guess let me just shift into spiritual neutral, expect a government handout, and then live on cruise control the rest of my life. Following Jesus is hard work. Why? Because we're hard-hearted people, and we got the spirit of dumb operating in us around the clock. And it's work to say no to your selfish desires. And it is work to say no to your old man. And it is work to engage in what they call the spiritual disciplines. It is not natural. It is supernatural. It is not material. It is spiritual in its nature. And friend, if Jesus had to work, so do we. Verse 6. Now, when he said these things, he spit on the ground and he made mud with his saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with that mud. He said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So he went and washed and he came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is this not the one who sat and begged? Watch the connection. In the beginning, the father breathes into dirt to make man. 
In John 9, the son spits into dirt and restores sight to the blind. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus says, I only do what I see my Father doing. Paul says, Jesus is the express image of the Father. The miracle recorded in John 9 communicates to the reader that the Father and the Son are of the same substance, consubstantial. They are of the same timeline. They are co-eternal. And they are of the same power and authority. They are co-equal. The scriptures say, from dust you came, and to dust you will go. See, Jesus takes the natural, which is the dust, he infuses it with the spiritual, and it becomes the ingredient for the miracle. Hear me, friend, the most important thing that Jesus added to the dirt wasn't his spit. It was his faith. See, many people have to be challenged in this. Because when they read the story of Jesus, especially in the four gospels, they think that Jesus operated the way that he did by always playing the Jesus card. Well, of course Jesus had miracles. He's Jesus. Of course he can heal the sick. He's Jesus. Of course he can walk on water. He's Jesus. But Jesus did what he did during his three and a half year earthly ministry, not as the son of God, but as the son of man. Now watch, the Bible says this, when Jesus was on the cross, he could have called down a legion of angels to minister to him, but he did not. Why? Because he operated as a man submitted to the authority of the father. He was always God and he was always man. He was hypostatic, meaning he was fully God and fully man, both at the same time. But what he did on earth was not by virtue of playing the God card. What Jesus showed us on earth is what what is possible for a man and a woman who lives a life completely surrendered to the authority and the power of the Father. Now watch. The Bible says that Jesus anointed the blind man with him. I love this. He anointed the blind man with the mud. All over scripture, they either anoint with oil or they anoint with costly perfume. And in John 9, Jesus anoints with mud. People ain't coming forward for a mud anointing service here at Pursuit. It's dignified. It's a little oil. I make the sign of the cross on your head. I pray for you. The mud was just wet dirt until faith came in contact with it. Your money is just a piece of green paper until faith comes in contact with it. That communion cracker is just a carb until faith comes in contact with it. For when faith from heaven mixes with an element from earth, it transforms its very nature and turns it into an avenue of supernatural power. Notice when the miracle takes place. Jesus says he goes to wash in the pool. And as the man came back, he came back seeing. This man could have got offended and went home when Jesus put mud on his eyes. He could have got lazy and went back to a buddy's house. He could have got distracted and gone back to begging. But the man washes in a pool as he is instructed and he comes back seeing. See, it's very interesting. The pilgrims, they would use the pool of Siloam for ritual purification prior to entering the temple. It was a place to be made clean prior to entering the presence of God. So Jesus sends a blind man with mud on his face to a pool where people are made spiritually clean. And as that man washes in that water, a miracle transpires on his behalf. See, I am convinced that you don't receive the fullness of what God desires to do in your life until you make a decision to wash away offense, bitterness, unforgiveness, and hurt from the vision of your life. 
Can you imagine the interior dialogue of this man as Jesus spits on the mud, spits on the dirt, makes mud, puts it on his eyes, and then tells him to go wash? Why couldn't you heal me like the rest of the people? Why couldn't you just say a word? Why couldn't you just put your hand on my eyes? Why couldn't you just say those things and call on the Father? Why do you got to do it this way? Because God will often offend your flesh in order to reveal your heart. I look so stupid, mud on my face, I'm a big disgrace, I gotta go to the pool, I gotta wash, oh yeah, this is the miracle I get, oh yeah, great. And the Bible don't say as soon as he hit the water, his eyes were opened. It's as he came back. See, I'm convinced that many believers only ever receive about half of their breakthrough because once they get it, instead of coming back, to where God is instead of coming back to where community is instead of coming back to give thanks for what God has done they allow the offense or the injury of the way things transpired to motivate them back to isolation and the Bible says as he came back he was seeing you know when we transitioned out of the last church that I was at to plant pursuit, it was the hardest thing that I had ever walked through. It was hard for a a variance of reasons. One day I'll write about it. I don't have time to explore all of the story today, but it was the most crushing experience of my life. And Pastor Jude said something last Sunday. I don't know how many of you caught it. Russ, I know you caught it, but he said this. He said, if you've never wept over your ministry, you don't have one. And as soon as he said it, I got transported nine years back because it's our nine year anniversary this September for planting the church. And I got transported back in time, nine years, as I wept before God over in many ways, the collapse of this young adult ministry that we had spearheaded for a number of years and saw God do amazing things all across the region. And everything in my heart wanted to run. I wanted to run back to politics. I wanted to go sell real estate. I wanted to do anything else but open up my heart to be hurt again by getting back involved in full-time ministry. But I was just convinced that if I will come back to God, he will do something on my behalf. And I know that I'm preaching today to folks in this room and you've been hurt in churches and you've been hurt by leaders and you've been hurt by pastors and you've been hurt in relationships and you've been hurt and offended by things. And I'm not saying that in a way like you're weak or you just couldn't take it. No, you've been really hurt and traumatized by the circumstances of life. And anybody else would have a really good excuse to just leave and never come back. But I'm telling you, the fullness of your healing is incumbent on your spiritual decision to come back and to give God glory and thanks in the midst of the things that have wounded your heart and the burdens that you carry. I'm coming back. And as he does, his eyes, they are opened. It's like the leper who comes back to give thanks. And all of a sudden, not only is he healed, but he is made whole. Now watch, this is where it gets good. Verse 14, now it was Sabbath when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. The Pharisees asked him again how he received sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and now I see. Watch the pattern. God had a responsibility and I had a responsibility, and the net result is that I was blind, but now I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division amongst them. Herein lies the problem of religion. The Pharisees cannot compute how a blind man could receive sight because the healing took place in a way that violated their understanding of the Old Testament law. So instead of celebrating that a blind man can now see, instead of celebrating that a drug addict is now free, 
Instead of celebrating that a marriage is now restored, instead of celebrating that a person has come out of addiction, bondage, and demonic possession into the kingdom of God, instead of celebrating that, the religious crowd must dissect and deconstruct the process of how the miracle unfolded so that they can adjudicate or determine whether or not it was a genuine act of God. Hear me, hear me, hear me. In today's world, that looks like a group of millennials who don't even attend church anymore, who instead of going to therapy, start a podcast so they can hold a magnifying glass up to someone else's ministry and demand accountability and answer for things that they disagree with. And you might think you're just being intellectual when you allow your questions to turn into complaints against the Almighty. But I'm telling you, it's the same playbook the Pharisees used 2,000 years ago. God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He'll save people you hate. He'll reach people you don't even ever want to see at church. He'll restore people who deserve all the pain that they're experiencing just to mess with the religious box in your mind. The Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. His parents answered and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him, he'll speak for himself. Now, why did his parents say these things? Because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed that he was the Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. So they again called the man who was blind and they said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He, I love this. I love this. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. See, the Pharisees are terrified. We can teach all day. We've memorized the Torah. We know all the laws of Moses, but this rabbi is different than us. When he spits on the ground, the blind receive their sight. When he walks through the graveyard, women receive back their dead. When he speaks, demons and devils flee in seven directions. The religious leaders are terrified that the people will see this and pretty soon they will begin to confess him as Christ so they go back to interrogating this poor man he don't even have time to celebrate that one of his five senses just started working for the first time in his entire life and exasperated the man replies I don't know if this man is a sinner or not according to your laws but there is one thing I do know I was blind but now I see. The church spends a lot of time arguing over stuff that blind people just don't care about. Oh, that was a woman preacher. I don't care. I was blind, but now I see. That was a Bethel worship song. I don't care. I was blind, but now I see. Well, I can't believe they'd have that guest. Well, I saw a documentary once and I'm not happy. Listen, when somebody is drowning, they don't care about the history of the man who throws them a rope. They're just glad somebody cared enough to see them when the religious crowd passed them over. I'll take the theology of a blind man more than the theology of a classically trained Pharisee any day of the week. 
because a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man who only has an argument. Let me end here. Watch. The only thing the Pharisees had the ability to cast out was a man who reminded them about their lack of power. A man who was blind, but now he sees. A man who was lost, but now he is found. In this story today, you are either the man born blind, overwhelmed with joy that Jesus has touched your eyes, or you are a Pharisee upset that God didn't check in with you before he ministered to someone you don't like. And regardless of where you stand with him, in a real way, this God is staring into your heart and into your soul today. You might feel overlooked. Nobody knows my name. Nobody knows my story. Nobody cares about my pain. There is a man named Jesus who is familiar with every square inch and ounce of your suffering. He is your great high priest. And today, the one whose eyes burn like fire is staring at you in this church. And our response is to say, God, at your word, let it be done unto me according to my faith. God, whatever it is that you require, it might not make sense, and in fact, if I know anything about God, he might do it in a way that offends me to reveal my heart. But God, at your word, I'll submit my life. I'll follow your instructions because I'm not willing to go another day with allowing what I have been born with to be the roadblock to me being born again. I'm really believing that in the Northwest, we're gonna have such a move of God that we're gonna have stories like Saul on the road to Damascus, blinders falling off his eyes all over the place. You're gonna have atheists getting saved, agnostics getting saved, Mormons getting saved, Muslims getting saved, backsliders getting saved, New Age getting saved, Buddhists getting saved, secularists getting saved. You're gonna have people whose hearts have been far from God. They have been born blind. They don't even know what they're missing. They've heard a lot of teaching. They've heard a lot of Pharisees who could adjudicate the scriptures. They've got a lot of people who could exegete the text. They've got a lot of teachers, but they got no fathers. They've got nobody who has dared themselves to believe that what God says is true and that he's still got the power to raise the dead. But they're going to encounter a God in pursuit. They're going to encounter a person in this room sitting next to them at a cubicle at work and you're going to see what others have overlooked and their life is going to come into the transformative power of God's spirit and they ain't never going to be the same. I am telling you, this region has been blind long enough, but Jesus is the light of the world and his light causes us to see again.